was going to change a little bit. And so I started uh, analyzing, uh, breaking down the new publications that were coming out and just sharing it with a very small group of people that I was friends with. Um, that went from daily posts to end up going every day for months and months. So it's been about 12 weeks now I have been writing these posts to um, my circle of friends and family that seem to slowly expand over the last couple of months. Um, but usually hitting about five or 8,000 people with the posts on how to safely shop, um, trying not to get caught up in the hype that we see on the internet, how to understand the data that was coming from the state and from the federal government and what our daily lives would look like moving forward. Um, I've never really taken the approach of trying to scare the daylights out of people. Um, what I've been trying to do with my writing and with any con consultation that I'm doing is trying to help people understand the risks and then try to work through creative ways and innovative ways to reduce that risk so that we can regain some sort of normalcy with what we're doing. So it is not my intent to be here or with anyone to try to say, you know, this is a really scary problem and you shouldn't do it. It is look at your unique, unique situation, appreciate and understand the risks of that situation and find ways to adapt um, so that we can proceed forward safely. So the unique situation that I think many of you are facing is um, we know with this particular respiratory pathogen that it is much more infectious indoors than outdoors. Um, just this week, one of the, the better studies that have come out have shown that um, viral survival, viral transmissibility um, is enhanced about 18 fold when we get inside. You are 18 times more likely to get sick, get infected in an indoor space than outdoors. Um, we know that when you have an enclosed space with lots of people and the air filtration and the air exchange is not good, you can end up with these super spreading events. And a super spreading event is basically where just a single person comes into your environment um, and they're releasing huge amounts of virus into that environment just through their breathing, um, but even more so when they're talking, when they're yelling, or when they're singing. When that happens, the respiratory droplets they're putting out um, are coming from deeper down inside their lungs. They're expelled at a faster rate, um, and they travel and aerosolize in the room to a much greater extent. When you have other people in that space that are also breathing in deeply to try to get their next breath for a song or for the words they're about to put out, um, we know that that allows those tiny little respiratory droplets to go deeper down into the lungs and find more receptive tissues. Um, just as an example, if I get the virus on my hands, I can't get infected. If I get the virus on my nose, I can't be infected. If I get it in my nose, I can be, but it's not as efficient. In my eyes, I can be, and it's a little more efficient. But if I breathe it in and get it into the back of my throat and into my lungs, those cells that are receptive for that virus, you might've heard the ACE2 receptor cells. There's lots of those cells down in that tissue, which means just a little bit of virus can establish infection. Um, and that's sort of where we are with this. We know those indoor spaces with lots of people. Um, the lots of people give the opportunity for one of them to be infected. And the lots of people give an opportunity for lots of people to be infected by that one. Um, and when we put them together with poor air exchange, poor filtration, that you can end up with um, 20 up to 80% of the people in that space be you know, becoming sick. Um, and you might have heard that before. It's called an attack rate. An attack rate is when everyone is exposed to the virus, how many of them become sick. And we're seeing these attack rates of 20 to 80% depending on the environment in which they're in. The difficult thing to manage with this particular virus, and it's part of the reason why this virus is so different to others that we've faced, 
is this period where people are infected and infectious, meaning they can infect other people, but they're not currently showing any symptoms. Um, and it's all called the subclinical infectious period. With most respiratory viruses, so influenza, that window where you can make other people sick, but you don't have a fever and you're not feeling sick is 24 hours. With the original SARS virus in 2003, it was 24 hours. With this virus, it's five days. So you can have a person um, that is feeling fine and every day they're building up more and more virus in their throat and in their lungs and they're releasing more and more virus every day right up until the day they've come at when they feel sick. And that is the first time that you would be able to take any measure to know that that person was sick and that could be a temperature check or a cough. The real dangerous part about this particular virus is those five days where you have no symptoms but can be releasing a lot of virus. Um, identifying those people is nearly impossible. You have to have huge amounts of testing. You need to have the PCR testing to do that. So we have to work out strategies, uh, mechanisms by which we can reduce the risk of those people reduce, releasing a lot of virus into the environment and reduce the risk of exposing a lot of people to those respiratory emissions in our environments. Um, that's sort of basically where I'd like to start and stop, if that's okay. Um, and then quite happy to take any questions that you may have. All right, so there is already a question in the chat. The first one from Doug. Does enforced face covering reduce the 18 to one indoors outdoors infectability ratio? Yeah, so face masks for some reason have ended up being a controversial topic. Um, and I've literally just put a post up before I came on here about face masks and what they do. Um, even the most basic face mask will stop about 50% of what you breathe out coming out into that environment. Um, I apologize, my dog is about to go crazy. Um, about 50% of what you put out will be stopped, will be trapped on the inside of that mask. Um, if you work on the, the concept of exposure to virus and time, you need to see enough virus over a long enough period of time to become sick. So that could be um, all in one go. So somebody sneezing on you provides those thousand viral particles that you need to get sick. But it could also come with a hundred breaths where you're taking in 10 viral particles each time. If someone is wearing a mask, we can drop that down to five. I'm just using fake numbers, but we can drop that down to five, which means that now rather than 100 breaths, we have 200 breaths. We have twice as long in that environment before we become risky. So masks, even at the most basic level, do provide you with a risk reduction, a harm reduction option that gives you twice as long in that environment between um, being in there and potentially becoming sick. The better quality mask that you put on, and I'm not talking about N95, I'm talking about, I'm wearing glasses and I'm sure many of you are wearing glasses and wear masks and it fogs up. That means that a lot of the air is sneaking up the mask and coming up into the air there. Your mask is not actually filtering, it's just capturing, capturing those spit, you know, little bits of spit that come out. Um, if you invest in a higher quality mask, one that sort of pinches down on your nose, then more of your breath goes through the filter material, which means even fewer emissions come out and the better again. So it was important at the start to buy the, you know, to make those homemade masks and those cheaper ones. Um, but what I am saying to people that are in environments for extended periods, it's time to invest in maybe a commercial one um, where they've got a good nose fitting maybe a drawstring under here so that more of our breath goes through those masks. Masks are definitely part of the solution, but not the solution. Great. Our next question, can testing detect the virus in people who are asymptomatic? Yeah, so when you get it exposed, 
you're not immediately infectious and you're not immediately be, a, be able to be tested to know you have the virus. Um, it gets into you, um, it penetrates into your cells, and then it uses your cells as a factory to make more copies of itself. And then it will move from one cell to the next to the next and builds up. Um, that period of time, if you get tested, you're likely not to come up as a positive because there's too little virus in you at that time. But as soon as you jump over into that infectious period, that means that you are producing enough virus, it is being released from the cells in the back of your throat and nose, and it can be picked up in a swab or it can be released with a sneeze. At that stage, testing is uh, quite reliable for picking up that you're infected, even if you are asymptomatic. Um, so if it tests too early, you won't know, but if you're testing while shedding, um, the chances of the test working are actually quite high in the 80 to 90% side of things. Our next question, what are you thinking about social distancing in terms of seating in theaters? We hear a variety of ideas from every other seat to a six foot radius and more. Yeah, and this is, I'm not trying to contradict the CDC. I'm not trying to contradict any state guidance. Um, but throwing a, a one single rule on everybody is just silly. Um, some people are working in community halls that have a window air conditioning unit, and that's it. Um, probably basements as well. That would be a worse scenario than being in a modern um, theater or a modern space that had good air quality filtration. So the system, even though it might be recirculating, they might have put in a higher quality um, air filter. Um, they may have UV inside the ductwork. Um, some of our theaters and some of our spaces, we might be able to open the windows and doors and have better air exchange. So everything is a trade-off. If we have a closed box or just a box that's recirculating the air, um, I will say this over and over again, six feet is not enough. If you're in that space and you've got a space that can't have air exchange or good air filtration, not just circulation, but filtration, six feet will not be enough because even with a mask, we capture those droplets, but there are little droplets that go up into the air. And without filtration or air exchange, they build up and they build up and they spread through that space and then other people in that room can start breathing those in. So you might have given yourself a longer time but there's still the risk of infection with those type of spaces. If we were asking about an aeroplane right now, I wouldn't be saying it's the same risk. And let's think shoulder to shoulder on an aeroplane is what we're seeing right now. Why? On a plane, every three to four minutes, the entire cabin volume is exchanged with fresh air from outside. Every four to five minutes, the entire cabin volume goes through a HEPA filter that can capture viruses in the air. That's why you can put people shoulder to shoulder in an aircraft, but not in a restaurant or a theater is because of the quality of um, air exchange. The six feet that we hear over and over again is purely to protect you from the person that is coughing, the person that is sneezing, or the person that is talking to you and the infection that can take place from that interaction. It doesn't protect you from the respiratory droplets that go up into the air. Um, so that's not trying to say, you know, nothing's going to be able to work. It's just that what you need to do is you really need to look at the environment in which you are wanting to perform or practice and really understand what the limitations of that building environment is. Um, there is a really good group of people that work on healthy buildings. Um, and if you want to look up healthy buildings, there's a great group that work out of Harvard with this. Um, it is not hard to take a space and make it better through just minimal engineering um, additions. Um, it can be as simple as improving or increasing the amount of makeup air. 
air that your air conditioner system brings in from outside and pumps in, rather than just being a turnover of once every hour, it may be three, four, five times an hour. Um, many HVAC places will put in a cheap filter that captures coarse particles. Um, invest in a higher quality bag filter that goes in the ductwork that captures more of the fine particles out of there. There are, there's those type of things we can do. Um, you can look at portable HEPA filters. So these are um, like a room air filter that has hospital grade filtration in them. Um, and some of them even come with UV. Those there in small spaces with just a few people can keep the air quality um, quite good and only help with the use of masks. So there are a lot of things that we can do depending on our individual spaces based on what you know about the engineering of the, the air exchange and the air filtration. So six feet, not enough if you don't have air exchange. Six feet could be enough if you've got okay air exchange and filtration. Um, six feet could be too much, as in you could have people closer together if we had masks and great air filtration and air exchange. Um, it's all a balance that we need to put together. Awesome. Um, let's see. Uh, I do want to let people know there are some great links in the chat. Uh, someone just put the link to Dr. Bra um, Bromage's uh, post about masks, so please be sure to grab that one. And Emma, thank you for posting the link for the Healthy Buildings website. Um, we have a comment. It would be great if the city could help organize an audit of our venue citywide on healthy building measures and somehow support that work financially. I think that's to you, Cara. Um, but we do have a couple other questions. Can you speak to the UVC as a strategy for sanitizing theaters between shows? Um, right, so UVC as, a, as walking around and trying to decontaminate surfaces, UVC is good. It will um, interrupt or break down the structure of the virus and inactivate it. But UVC is only good if it can see it. It has to be a direct line of sight from the light to that. So if you want putting it over the top of an armrest, the underneath of the armrests won't get it. That's the problem with UV light in regards to doing surfaces. Um, I don't want to discount the, the risk of surfaces, um, but there is a little bit of a misunderstanding about surfaces and contamination. Um, if I was sick and I coughed on my hand and I put it on an armrest, at that stage there, the most amount of virus that I could deposit would be on that surface, but immediately it starts breaking down. And you might have seen studies about saying it survives for 24 hours on cardboard or three days on plastic. That's from going from the highest level all the way down to where it's not detectable anymore. So when we're looking at surfaces, it's not that it's infectious all the way up to three days. It just means that with these super sensitive tests, they could detect it out to three days and no longer um, find it and find infectious material. So if you had people in there, um, you had a night, it's not like you need to go in immediately and disinfect just by letting the room sit the viral load, the amount of virus that is alive in that environment starts to decrease immediately because the virus does not like surviving outside of a host. So then if you taught, brought your cleaning crews in the next day, you've actually lowered the risks down quite considerably because the virus has been on this death curve um, for the last few hours or overnight. Um, so back to UVC, UVC has a great place inside air conditioning ducts, um, a properly sized UV bulb for the flow of air that comes past it will destroy the viability of live virus in the air. Um, and that can work as a supplement to your filtration. Um, when I look at walking around with UV, especially UVC ones, I, I understand their utility. I worry about the damage that can come to the person that's using them. Um, UVC is quite damaging. 
Um, we don't have to worry about it outside because most of it gets filtered out by the atmosphere. Um, and they are good at disinfection, but they only can only disinfect what they see. They can't penetrate into material. They can't get into nooks and crannies. Um, I can't say I'm a huge fan of the thought of walking around with a UVC lamp and trying to um, decontaminate a, a theater space. Um, I think there are simpler solutions to wipe down high contact surfaces. Um, maybe some of these new disinfecting sprays if we really wanted to be careful. Um, but I think that I, my general feeling is that would be overkill. If you're going to invest in UV, put it inside your ductwork. Um, our next question, what about an outdoor theater? Absolutely. Um, that's what I've been trying to, we've got some local theater groups down with me here on the southern part of Mass. Um, and I've been saying, just to use our amphitheater at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, we have this beautiful outdoor amphitheater there. Um, you could set it up out there and know that you're still presented with a risk, but let's just take the numbers that were presented earlier in the week. The risk is 18 times lower for the same number of people in the same space. Um, that's pretty good. Let's throw on masks to that. And now we've lowered it down even more. Um, I've even been talking with some of the local mask manufacturers on, um, it's not necessarily for theater, it's in three months time, I'm going to have to stand in front of a classroom and lecture. And I don't want a mask on my mouth because I can't project properly. It feels horrible. Um, I'm like, think about how we can make masks with more space out the front of it that provide the filtering, allow you to project, but still provide safety to the people that are around you. Um, so I, I have been trying to push both that side on masks, um, but also saying, Theatre companies think about getting outside and maybe just arranging what you're doing during rehearsals um, so that we don't have people standing behind others and their droplets projecting behind, maybe more of a line rather than staggered in front of each other. Um, putting people together in amphitheatre style where they can spread out and separate and then you don't have to worry about um, air exchange, you don't have to worry about filtration because you've got mother nature to do that for you. Um, I really think that that is a great idea where we can. What about singing outdoors? How far apart would people have to be to, how far apart people have to stand apart? Yeah, so um, there is not a hard and fast rule, um, but we've been presented with a lot of these situations, not from theater, but from um, some of the, the groups that I'm working with where you have to talk to people face to face um, in very, very small environments. Um, for example, court interpretation, when you're interviewing somebody that may be being held in jail, you get put in this tiny little room, you're three feet away from them. Um, there's quite a bit of danger that happens there. So what I tell people when they're in those situations is don't talk face to face talk like you are walking down a corridor, um, so, you know, shoulder to shoulder, so that you're both projecting forward. When you're projecting forward, things are going forward and dropping down, not going across into the face of the other person. Um, the riskiest thing that we can do is face-to-face -face conversations or face-to-face -face singing. Um, conversations we think of as six feet. Singing, you're projecting a little bit further, that six feet face to face is still going to be risky. But if you can have people that are outdoors and singing you know, six feet apart or even four feet apart with wind blowing into their face, or they're all um, talking, singing downwind. So one big line and the wind blowing from behind them, the risk is almost negligible at that particular stage. Um, singing so that the, the wind blows from one to the next to the next, you could see how that leads to a problem. Um, we're talking with people that are bike riding, that are drafting. You don't want to be drafting right now when people are bike riding because the breath of one goes onto the person that's behind it. Go side by side. You could even be shoulder to shoulder. As long as you don't turn, turn your head to the side and project out that way, it's quite a safe activity. So again, outdoors, we don't need to be six feet apart if the wind is working to blow it away from us. 
How do you put an orchestra in an orchestra pit? <laughs> um, I, I honestly don't know. Um, so there was a study that came out um, the end of the week before that showed that things like trumpets and oboes and any of the, the low blow, like high volume, but low blow equipment um, is actually not a high risk. The, the highest risk pieces of um, musical equipment were flute, piccolo. Um, there was one other ones where you've got um, very strong emissions over a very small area they can aerosolize, they can take your respiratory droplets and break them up even further and project them out. So there are certain um, woodwind instruments that are quite dangerous in the sense that they do project these aerosols a long way. So um, I said flute, piccolo, and I'm blanking on the other one and I will try to find it for you. Um, you probably know better than I do about any of those instruments that have those really narrow mouthpieces. Um, but the ones where you're talking about, uh, you know, just having to empty with spittle um, at the end of it and low flow air that comes out of it, it may seem like they're worrisome, but other than the spit that comes on the floor, which you need to think about, um, the rest of what's being projected out is no greater danger than what we're seeing from, you know, just unmasked talking. Um, the other people down in there, the people that can wear masks, you're probably looking at needing to work with um, a public health official and invest in proper N95 respirators if we're going to put people together. Um, an N95 respirator will not only capture what you're breathing out, it will filter the air that you're breathing in and it's what's keeping our doctors and nurses safe. Um, they are incredibly difficult to learn how to use and fit correctly. Um, I only get it right about 75% of the time, um, but with a bit of training you can. But that orchestra pit, again, being an even more enclosed space is something that you need to think about seriously. Um, really work out how you can improve the ventilation, um, the air exchange down there. Um, uh, and I mean, I'd hate to say you can't do it, but I mean, it just, that seems like one of the more worrisome ones that you could have just because of the time, the density of people and the enclosed, really enclosed space that they're in. Uh, we got a few more questions. Let's see. Uh, so someone did ask to direct us to the study. So if you could email that to Cara and I, and we could try to send it out to the list. Um, Will localized heat filters in the pit help? Localized heat heat filters? Heap with a P. HEPA, HEPA, HEPA. Oh, HEPA. HEPA, sorry. There we go. Sorry. I was like, I don't know if the, the people in the pit would like to have a lot of heat down there. Um, so HEPA filters are quite amazing. Um, they're a, this pleated membrane that capture 99.999 plus percent of things at the size of a virus. Um, so they are definitely good for the air, air filtration. Um, but they can only be as good as the amount of air that they can turn over and the size of the room that they're in. So putting one modestly sized unit in a big room is not going to have the same beneficial effect as putting that same one inside an office size space. So they need to be balanced accordingly. Um, so make sure that the size of the, the HEPA filter um, is appropriate for the size of the space and the number of people that you have there. Um, let's see yet. I think just a couple more questions. Uh, do you have any recommendations for multi-stalled restrooms? Should we be considering different filtration or modification for those specific spaces? Yeah, so restrooms are sort of a, a black box in this whole thing right now. Um, until recently, um, it had been hypothesized that 
you could catch it from fecal oral type way. Um, and then earlier this week, it was shown that that actually can happen, that a person that is infected is releasing live and viable and infectious material um, from their feces. Not so much from their, their pee or not at all from, from urine. So it's the, the feces side of things that can be there. Um, so it comes down to really good hand hygiene. Um, I mean, we sh should all have that anyway without being inside a global pandemic. Um, bathrooms are just a, a high contact surface zone that has some quite nasty bugs in it. So um, I have been working with some of the, the local businesses here where they use outsourced, you know, it's porta potties and things like that. Rather than having centralized ones, we're having decentralized so people don't have to walk so far. Um, we're having things like paper towel and hand sanitizing stations outside of the bathrooms. Uh, why outside? A person walking in can grab a paper towel, use it to open the door. They can use it to open the bathroom door. They can do their business. They can grab then a piece of toilet paper or do the same type of thing on the way back out or to turn a faucet handle. And then when they come out, you need to have a garbage there for them to put that paper in. They can sanitize their hands and we're good. Um, so just thinking about ways to minimize contacting of surfaces, uh, we do need to increase the cleaning of those spaces as much as we can. Um, but bathrooms, while theoretically are a source of infection, um, there's only one case that we've seen worldwide where it looks like the bathroom may have been involved in a, a larger outbreak. Um, and that was a bathroom in a mall um, in South Korea. So theoretically it can happen, but it's not a big driver of infection as much as what you would you get from talking or being in an enclosed space for a long period of time. Just work out ways that you've got sanitizing station, extra paper towels, and cleaning them a little bit more often. Okay. Um, what about airflow within a room? If HVAC has good filters, but some people are next to the air, return air intake. Yeah, so um, one of the more famous studies was the restaurant um, study from China. Um, basically, you had one table, two tables, three tables, the air conditioner up here, it was blowing air across, down, brought back in under, and then back up and through. Person at the middle table was infected. The air blowing down infected 75% of the people at the table downwind from them. And then the return air coming back through infected 50% of the people, people at the table that was upwind from them because of that circular airflow. Um, it is certainly something that we need to think about. Um, Air exchange is more important than air filtration if we can get it. Opening windows, opening doors, having as much of inside air, outside air coming in and going out is really the optimum of where we want to be in regards to indoor spaces. Um, but then we do need to think about not all of our spaces can do that, so then it comes down to filtration. Um, that's a little bit beyond my scope of expertise, um, but I can definitely say that a person sitting near a vent that was infected, and you're not going to know who is, was infected and it's blowing out, will present a greater problem for the people down wind of that. And you would want to have the people that are the most compliant with mask use at those particular areas. You could not be um, laxed with having somebody sitting there wearing a chin mask because they don't like it. That's just, I know it's hard and I see, I see on airplanes and things like that now, no one wants to enforce the policy of masks. But if you're looking at it from protecting your guests and protecting your staff, we have to work out a way to be able to um, get them to comply with what we're trying to do, which is create a safe work, a safe um, 
environment for everybody that's there. We did have a follow-up question about the uh, uh, multi-stall toilet situation. Uh, does, fl does flushing then cause the air in a bathroom to be very infectious? <laughs> I hate those studies. Toilet studies. Um, so one of the worst public health mistakes ever made was to make public toilets without lids. Um, I, they do it because of cleaning, but a lid will capture about 80 to 90% of the toilet plume that comes when you flush. When you flush a plume, um, think about when you go outside on a cold winter's day and you see your breath, that's a plume. A toilet does the same type of thing when you flush, it sends a plume up. If there's a lid, that plume is held in there to almost, you know, only about 20% of it escapes. So flushing toilets do actually present a problem. Um, and it's one of the benefits of the Porter Johns is there's no flushing and when it hits, it's neutralized. Um, so there's not a lot that we can do about it now with that. Um, again, if flushing and infectious people was a primary driver of infection, we would see it in the data more and more. We would have seen it in schools. We would have seen it in universities we would have seen it in malls more than we have. It is a risk. We need to keep those toilets cleaner than what we ever have. We do need to put a few extra um, intervention steps there, such as those paper towels and uh, hand sanitizing stations, but it's not where we need to be spending the most amount of our effort in control measures. That really comes from air exchange, air filtration, mask use, and controlling the numbers of people we have. That's where we need to spend our effort. All right, I think there's about three more questions left. We, have, we do have about 14 minutes left before the hour is up. What does our long-term future look like, knowing what you know? When we'll be able to sing together again in the same room? Is it all about a vaccine? Yeah, so a, a vaccine gets us to the same spot as letting this virus run through and kill who it's going to kill. It just gets us there without, um, all the death, uh, all the morbidity. Um, I think every life lost is, a, is very sad, but I actually am more worried about the people that survive um, that look like they have near permanent lung damage. Um, the, the recovery from this is very, very long. This, the tissue damage in the lungs is incredibly rough. Um, so I have these worries and that's why herd immunity sounds great through letting it run through, but it's not all about the deaths, it's about the morbidity and what happens to everybody else. So in Boston, we're looking at around about five to 6% of the people have been infected so far. Um, that's on the, in the, the areas that have really been hit hard. Um, in my area in the South Coast, we're probably two or 3%. Um, to get to the herd immunity stage without a vaccine, um, we need 60 to 70%. So we have a really long way to go. Um, at this sort of slow burn, we're looking at years. So that's sort of the, the downside of things with that. Um, as more people get infected and recover, um, the virus doesn't, it slows down a little bit because it can't find a body as easy to get into. Um, but it is going to be a while. Um, our saving grace might be a therapeutic intervention. So we didn't need a vaccine for scarlet fever, strep throat, because antibiotics work so well. Um, but for measles, there is no antibiotic, there's no antiviral, so we needed a vaccine. So we are testing a huge number of anti antivirals. Um, if we can find one that you take a tablet and it knocks it out, we get back to normal very, very quickly. Um, but we haven't found that miracle pill yet. So the vaccine is our, our best bet of regaining 100% normalcy um, for our future. And it's just a matter of how long that's going to take. Um, there are certain things that you can't hurry in a vaccine trial. Um, because of it's not just whether it works, it's whether it's safe. And the fastest vaccine we've ever put out, ever been, been made is four and a half years. 
So when you see that Dr. Fauci is pushing back against anyone saying we'll have one this year and saying 12 to 18 months is being optimistic, there is a reason why. Um, the first, you've probably heard of phase one, two, and three. Phase one is not about whether it works. It's about whether it hurts or kills the people that get that vaccine. So they only put it into 20 or 30 people at a time and to see whether, do they have an allergic reaction? Um, do they have an asthma attack? Do they faint? Do they get Guillain-Barre syndrome? And if there are a lot of adverse reactions, that vaccine candidate is gone. They throw it out. And the vast majority of vaccine candidates die in the lab or phase one. Phase two is, okay, we didn't hurt anybody. So we're now going to incorporate more people to get more genetic diversity and vaccinate them. And we're going to look for rarer reactions. Um, so now we'll do 500 or maybe 1,000 people. And now we're looking for rarer reactions, but we're not really looking at does it protect because you've got to have enough time to understand how many people get infected versus not. Again, that takes months and months. It normally takes years because you want to make sure it has no long-term effects as well. The third phase is then, does this actually work? So you grab two big groups of people, 10,000 people that get a control injection, 10,000 people that get the vaccine, and you just let them out into the wild. And then you have a look at how many people in the vaccinated group get sick and how many people in the unvaccinated group get sick. And it takes years and years for that because they've got to be exposed to the virus exposed to the bacteria, to the toxin first. That normally takes years. Um, where we are cutting corners a little bit is there is a quite a strong conversation, an ethical conversation about, is it suitable to actually infect people on purpose? And that's where we are right now, is that that medical ethics debate is happening right now is, can we take two groups of people, one vaccinated and one not, and infect them on purpose when we know that we have no treatment for this virus? It means that some people will die in this study. We have never done this before. Um, but in order to expedite this vaccine, this is what's being discussed. And I actually think it's going to happen. Uh, 14,000 people have put their hand up to be involved in that study, um, basically saying that they will altruistically volunteer for a study where they know they could die with it. It's those type of things and those choices that people are going to make that will get us to the vaccine sooner. Um, I have a lot of faith that we will get there. There are over 70 com companies working on this. Um, I have never seen this level of coordination and collaboration amongst companies and scientists ever. But when you hear Dr. Fauci and other immunologists and vaccinologists saying 12 to 18 months, there is a reason for that. And it means that we are cutting corners and we are sprinting to get to that goal. Um, but that's the window that we're looking at is if we've got something by January, it will be amazing and we should think um, you know, that a miracle has actually happened for that to occur. Um, if we have it by next fall, I think the, there's a much higher chance of that actually happening. So um, to get to normal vaccine or a treatment, I don't know when, we are going to have to adjust in the meantime. So before we um, take I think we have time probably for a couple more questions, but we are getting close to the end of the hour. I do just want to say to, to Katie's comment and a couple of others that have come up, we are going to follow up with everybody on this call afterwards to capture what are the questions that this is bringing up for you? Are there specific questions that we haven't gotten to? Um, and other ideas that you have like support around building auditing, uh, which came up. Um, so that we can track those and respond and find other ways to bring resources or more conversations like this to you. Um, if you have a specific question, you could also include it in the chat as we go. Even if we don't get to it, we will be saving all of that and, and cataloging it. Um, and with that, I'll just turn it back over to the Q&A so we can use the next five minutes. 
Awesome. Okay. Where were we? Um, so I'm going to hybrid two questions. So, so many of us have venue entrances on city streets, sidewalks. Do you have any advice for how to queue lines and keep patrons distance and improve safety on public sidewalks? And again, with um, protocols, do you think of, uh, do you have an idea of what the metric will be for people to feel safe to reopen as normal in that same vein? Yeah. So, um, the way that I'm sort of talking with restaurants is as, uh, and it's the same for you, you need to treat whoever turns up together as a pod. If they've chosen to come in a car together, if they've chosen to socialize together, that's their business and they are there in a pod and you can treat them as a single unit. So it's not like you need to keep people six feet apart that are a pod. Um, now you might find people that will argue against that, but if they're choosing to be together to come to the theater or to a restaurant, they're doing it outside of that environment. What one of them has, all of them have. Um, so the way that I look at um, appropriate social distancing, lining up outside, is that you can get people in pods. Um, six feet or more apart outside with masks uh, in pod units. So not an individual person. Um, I saw people lining up for a bus and they were lined up around the corner down the street and it took 10 minutes to load the bus with 40 people. Um, I look at it as treat them as a unit, treat them as a pod, put them together and move them as pods at least six feet apart from, from each other. Um, I like the, the little stars and that that people put out like stand here, the cones. I think some of our grocery stores have done very well. I was in Lowe's the other day and they had a chain with a cone and they had them every six feet and it just gave people a visual reference. Um, one of the grocery stores put shopping carts up in the air, uh, tilted them back and had them up and people knew you stood next to a shopping cart. Um, so each pod stood next to there. So there's ways to do it. You don't need to be diligent about separating individuals in a group out because they've come together, they're going to be together, you're not achieving anything out of it. What was the other parts of that question? What are the metrics, uh, where is it? Oh, oh, so many questions. Uh, here we go. Outside an effective treatment and vaccine, are there are any other metric that you would look to make venues safe to reopen as normal? Yeah, so there is one metric that we all should be using and we all should be looking at is, M, uh, is our state testing effectively? Um, and how many people, how many new infections are we getting in my area? So to know if we're testing effectively, we need to be doing lots of testing. And you'll see that there is a, a metric called a positive to test ratio. Okay, so if I do 100 tests, how many of those come up positive? We want to be at two to 5%. If we're at two to 5%, we know we're capturing the vast majority of community transmissions. The lower the number, two, one, half, the better it is, we're doing a better job. Um, at the moment in Massachusetts, we're sitting at 10% as a state. Um, and in some areas, it's as high as 20. If that's the case, there is not a lot that you can do to open safely if you are drawing people from that area. Because if we are looking at one in every 10, and it's not that high, but let's say one in every 50 people having a current infection, and you put together a group of 100 people for a theatre production and show, two people in that room, on average, are going to be infected. So we need to have an understanding of what the level of um, community transmission, the prevalence of the infection is in our community right now. And we won't get to that until we test more. So um, Massachusetts has done well. We've come from 27% down to nine or 10%, but we still have to get down to five, four, three, two, one. So that is a metric on safety. Um, if I was having this conversation with my family in Australia, I wouldn't be having, we wouldn't be talking the same way now because they're testing a thousand people to find one case. So you can put a hundred people together in a um, studio, in a theater, and know that the probability of infection is 0.1%. 
that's a risk that you have a higher risk driving to the theater. So we need to, you need to become epidemiologists. You need to look at that state data, look at the data that from where you're drawing people from, you need to be lobbying your state to test more because when you see us get into that two to 5% range and you see that daily cases are low, you now have a metric that it's safe to open. And I think on that note, we've, we've reached the hour. Um, as, I was, as I'm closing in these last 60 seconds, please feel free to add any comments to the chat that you want us to capture and we'll follow up with everyone over email. Um, but I wanna just say thank you to everybody who was able to join the call and thank you, Aaron, for being here um, and yeah. sharing your time and just being willing to answer all sorts of questions um, so as we try to if figure needed, this out. Because um, I can see there's a lot of questions. Um, and if you're doing this regularly, just ask and I will come back if I've got the time. Um, if people have found it helpful and have questions, even when they start looking at their own environment now and getting things in, if I can help, just ask. That's amazing. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. You're more and than thank welcome. you all. Have a good afternoon. Um, I might see some of you in a minute. I might not. Um, thanks again, Dr. Bromage, and we will be in touch with everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend.